So we have been going through a series about being an example. Did anyone get an opportunity to be an example this week? You got a you got an opportunity? It was it was a good example? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want me to go about it? Well, I I would like to hear about it, but um Okay. Well, Mrs. Bagbemi, myself, um, Marilyn, and Vanessa. We all went up to visit someone mm -hmm. and uh in the hospital and had a chance to testify. Mm -hmm. And Anoint this particular person and this is the person that's on the prayer. Okay. There's Maryland's friend. And uh, yeah, so I think we're a good example. This particular person said that they would come and visit us someday. So okay. we hope that they would. Definitely, yes. Yeah, so that, that's that's an awesome testimony. So it's, it's great when we can be an example uh, to others. And so we've been going through the series in First Timothy in chapter four, verse 12. So, so before we, we get to first Timothy, I just want to do a, a recap review of what we spoke about last Sabbath uh, for anyone that wasn't here, anybody that didn't tune in. Uh, so we spoke about conduct and love. So conduct is our behavior. So whether we're being kind to one another, we're being um, gentle, caring. And we spoke about love. There's so much to say about love. We love our brothers. We love our spouses. We just love, you know, your coworkers. So we also talked about love is an action because we can just previously say, I love you, but we, you want to show people that you, that you, that you love. Them. So I'm married, right? If y'all didn't know. Okay. Um, so my wife likes to, let's say I, I would do a whole bunch of things around the house um, it says 10 p.m. I brush my teeth. I do this, do this, and this. As soon as I get in the bed, she was like, hey, can you give me some water? Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, I was just walking around this room for like, you know, 10 minutes and, you know. So, but I get back up out the warm bed, fix her some water to show her that I love her. Oh. Right? So, also, love is sacrificial. So, we we, we see that our Savior, he, he, he sacrificed his life on the cross mm -hmm. uh, on our behalf for a debt that we could never be able to pay. Um, also, we talked about love is the goal or love is the key, if you're a Maze fan. So love is godly, obedient, absolute trust, and it's limitless, especially coming from our Father. So part three, we are going to speak about spirit and faith, spirit and faith. So Paul, in his letter to Timothy, encouraged him to be an example to the believers. So in this, he was to conduct himself in a manner that was exemplary to the ones who were followers of Yeshua in complete submission and obedience to the Holy Spirit. He was to practice godly conduct that comes from a godly attitude. In life and in worship, which God has defined through Christ our Savior. So we ought to live a life that demonstrates uh, an absolute yield to the control of the Holy Spirit. So Glenn told us a, a, a testimony of him going to see someone that you didn't even know this person, right? And you take time out of your day to go and pray for someone and, and lift them up. So it demonstrates an absolute yield to the control of the Holy Spirit with unrestricted obedience to his will and instructions. So Paul's exhortation to Timothy is simply put, be an example in spirit or walk in the spirit. So this is a demonstration of the life of Christ in us. And I said this a couple of weeks ago that when we're out and about, we want to see, we want people to see Christ in us, right? And I remember when I first started working at my job and, um, you know, I'd go out my way to, to help people, uh, just like I get out the warm bed to fix my wife some water. Um, and this one, a coworker of mine, I didn't even know the guy's my first time meeting. He said, he said, are you a believer? I said, definitely. I'm a believer. So he said, man, you know what? He said, I, I just see God in you. Mm -hmm. And I was flattered. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. Okay. So I thought to myself, maybe I'm doing something right. You know, when in my mind, sometimes I'm not doing 
it right all the way, you know, but we want people to see, you know, God in us. So again, we have to be the best example possible, especially to new believers. But to be that good example, we have to be walking close to God. We have to be spending time studying his word, being in his presence through prayer and meditation. We have to make sure God's presence is in our lives at all times so we can make sure that we're being the example that our people need. So let's look at some words for how spirit is used throughout the scriptures. So the Greek word for spirit is Strong's G4151, and it's called pneuma. It's called pneuma. So pneuma is also described as the wind or how the wind blows. And one of Brown's driver Briggs definitions is the disposition or influence which fills and governs the soul of anyone. So we want God's spirit to be dwelling inside of us, filling us. It's like having a cup and God's spirit is, is being put in that water and it overflows. So one of the many strong definitions for this word also is the rational soul. And we think about rational, we think about um, someone that thinks logically, someone that seeks truth. Now, Glenn has told me many stories about his upbringing and you know, he was a bad boy. He may have been running through the neighborhood, knocking over trash cans. And then his the neighbor brought him over there by his ear. And his mom was like, not my son, Glenn. There has to be a rational explanation for this. Yeah. You know, so because it's not Glenn is never irrational. He's always a rational person. Mm -hmm. So but we want to seek truth. We want to think logically. <clears throat> So pneuma is also translated as a current of air, breath, blast, or breeze. In the Greek, this word describes the blowing of the wind again, like the trees and the breath that would fill our lungs or the breath that you would blow up a balloon with. So it's usually translated as spirit in the Greek and pneuma, and you ever heard of a pneumatic drill? It's kind of a, a, a root word and pneumatic drills are supported with, with compressed air. Also, Numa appears in the New Testament 385 times. So it describes an attitude. So turn, turn with me, if you, if you will, to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. So 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. So in verse seven says, and it's in the New King James Version, it says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Also turn with me to Galatians 6.1. So we're going to go to Galatians chapter six and verse one. And verse one says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So when I think about what Paul told Timothy to be an example in spirit, he wants him to correct people with love, be gentle to the people that's in the congregation. Uh, but also consider yourself also, lest you also be tempted. So again, it's easy for us to get tempted and, and as the youngsters say, get lost in the sauce. So Numa also describes the non-material part of a person, the invisible part that gives life to the body. So next, I want to go to Matthew 27. And I would like a volunteer reader. So we're going to go to Matthew 27. And we're going to start in verse 50. Verse 50. Verse 50? Yeah. But we're going to start in here first. Verse 50. Okay. Matthew 27, verse 50. The verse 50. And go to what? Oh, just 50? Just 50. Okay. 
Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. <laughs> that, that's the King James Version. Okay. What, yielded up the, his spirit. He yeah. yielded up his spirit. Yeah. Um, I used to be confused, you know, when I would first started reading it, you know, with the, the term ghost. I, I did that term didn't sit well with me, yeah. you know. I, when I think ghost, I think, you know, Scooby Doo catching, you know, ghost. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I would much rather spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So Yeshua died and he gave up his spirit. Now let's look at Acts 1. Because he told his followers that he was going to send a helper. He was going to send a comforter to them. So we're going to go to Acts 1. All right, Acts 1, and we're going to start in verse 7. Can I get an online reader, please? Not all at one time. <laughs> okay. You read? Okay. All right, so Acts chapter 1, verses 7, and I presume verse 8? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As well. All right, so Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Yeshua said to the apostles, to the disciples, it isn't for you to know times or seasons which the Father has set within his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of of the earth. The uttermost part, so mm -hmm. to the end of the earth, right? So Numa, Numa. Mm -hmm. So he, Yeshua said that he would he would send out a comforter, he would send a helper to help discern, mm -hmm. to help teach us things. So next let's go to John chapter three. So we're going to go to John chapter three. And we're going to read verse one through eight. Yes, Miss Bob. Thank you. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus that night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is a him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born spirit. Thank you, Miss Barbara. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Nicodemus was perplexed. And and Yeshua was like, You're a, a, a leader in Israel, you're a teacher. And how do you, how you don't know these things, right? And and I, I, I always think, why didn't Nicodemus know these things? Because when we read in the Old Testament, we see, you know, God's spirit is, is prevalent. On Genesis 1, on the very first page, we see his spirit hovering over the deep. We, we see the, the, the Israelites going through the Red Sea. That, they say that was a, a type of baptism. 
We read in Ezekiel about being sprinkled with water. So Nicodemus was a teacher. He was, it was a student of the word. And we would think that he would, he would know these things. So most assuredly, he said, I say to you, we speak that we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. I have told you, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So sometimes it's, it's hard to, to, to fathom, you know, the things of, of the spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have another word for spirit in the Hebrew. Some of you may be familiar with it's called Ruach. And this is Strong's H7307. So Ruach is one Hebrew word for spirit. And again, pronounced Ruach. So it is translated as breath and also even translated as understanding. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11. <clears throat> so we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 1 through 3. So verse one says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse <clears throat> and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears. So this was was prophetic of of Yeshua the Messiah, you know, coming to coming to this earth, and he was going to have the spirit spirit of wisdom and understanding as well. So ruach also means understanding. So let's go to Proverbs sixteen. So we're going to go to Proverbs 16. And we're going to start in verse 1. Okay, can I get a volunteer reader? So we're going to read verse 1 and verse 2. Yes, ma'am. Well, oh, I just, any, anybody that, that, that would like to read. All right, Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from Yahweh. All the ways of a, of a man are clean in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the motives. Hmm. So when we, we think about this, man thinks he's right in his life, in his own eyes, but God sees the heart. He sees our thoughts. He weighs our heart. So he knows when we're going to act justly. We, he knows when we're going to be gentle and we're going to be caring. And if we're walking in his spirit, we are going to, to do those things. What translation were you reading? The web version. All right, next, I want to go to John chapter 20. Now that scripture that you just read didn't have the word "ruach" in there. It does. It mm -hmm. doesn't motivate my spirit. That's what made me ask what version you would read. Yeah, okay. in the New King James version, it has a. It says it, it weighs uh, our spirits justly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So we're going to John 20, and we're going to start in verse 21 and 22. Let's 
13. John 20. John. Yes, and we're going to start in verse 21 to 22. You want to read, Mr. Silas? Yep. Thank you, kind sir. So Jesus, so Jesus said to them, Peace to me, as Father has sent me, I also sent you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're going to read the next verse also. Yep, you forgive and sin of any. They are forgiven. They are forgiven. Them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Great hand. Thank you, Mr. Silas. So Yeshua has come to his disciples um, after he's risen. He he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So they they inhaled in his spirit. Uh, he gave them the power to continue the mission uh, and they grew as a community. We apologize to everyone for our technical difficulties. All right. So, so I was, what I was getting at is that when I read here that Yeshua, he breathed on his disciples and they got the spirit. So do you think that we have to be submerged in water, hands laid on to get the spirit. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's one example, the example of Cornelius, mm -hmm. where he received the Holy Spirit before baptism. Yeah. So it's not necessary for it to go in that order. Okay. So that, because I've heard numerous times that if you're not, you know, baptized, hands laid on you by elders, you don't have God's spirit. So I just want to see if we had any differences of uh, opinions. Yes. All right, so we're going to continue. So, but his 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 disciples, his followers, they grew as a community. They went out, preached the word mightily, and we think about how you know Peter, Paul, how they these. They, these people were transferred, um, you know, with, with their lifestyle, things that they did. Like Peter was a, a unruly guy, you know, he, then he got God's spirit. He started to soften up. He started, you know, learning what, what God expects of him to communicate to the people that they're trying to draw in. So the next word for spirit we'll look at in scripture today it is Strong's Hebrew word H5395, and it's called Neshem. And it's called Neshem. 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 Pardon my English accent. <clears throat> so it means to pant like a woman travailing in labor, to blow away or to destroy. And Vanessa gave me a good example of what panting is. Because I, I wasn't familiar with the panting and she was, that's what panting is. I wasn't, I wasn't familiar. So we'll see an example of, 
Yahweh doing something similar in Isaiah 42, 13 through 14. So let's go to Isaiah 42. So we're going to go to Isaiah 42, and we're going to start in verse 13. Can I get a volunteer reader? Ms. Marilyn, you look like you want to read. Oh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start your question. You have to think about baptism, okay? All right. <laughs> I know, right? Okay, where am I reading? Where, where? Isaiah 42. And we're going to start 13 and 14. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Isaiah 14. <laughs> 42. <laughs> 13 and 14. Okay. All right. So it says, um, I'm reading from the NIV. Okay. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. The shout will raise the battle cry and will triumph over the, his enemies. For a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held my back, myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. I gasp and pant. So that's an example of, of, of panting. So it says that the, the Lord was a man of war. And we think that you know we know god is love but he have many facets so his spirit moves to destruction when his when his enemies are to be defeated so when our enemies are to be destroyed so he walks before us every single day he's on the side and i always think about you know certain things that happen i told y'all last week how um i had a flat tire and i couldn't make it to work and i always think you know Things happen for a reason in, in, in my mind. I was like, you know what? If I would wouldn't have had a flat tire, I would have went out on 285 somewhere and maybe got into a wreck. And who knows what could happen, you know? So I, I think, you know, we're being protected. He destroys our, our enemies. And um, the enemy is out to get us. He wants to devour us like the roaring lion. So lastly, we're going to look at Strong's H7602. And this is a Hebrew word called, I need some help, Vanessa. Shah, ah, Shah, ah. <laughs> so now, Shah, ah, and this word means to gasp, also means to pant after, uh, desire, snuff up, to inhale eagerly. I inhale eagerly quite often. I snore a lot at night. And also, it means to be angry. So can I get another reader, please? We're going to read Psalms 119. And we're going to start in verse 131. So Psalms 119. I pant with expectation, longing for your commands. All right. So we should we should pant, we should long for, we should desire and swallow up God's commandments. Because he said, if if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's right. So all of these words, Ruach, especially, Numa, they have they have the same fundamental meaning. So it's an invisible force or power. So we think about wind blowing. We can't physically see it, but we see the evidence of the wind. We see trees swaying from side to side. We see uh, the leaves blowing. You might be out in the desert somewhere. You see the tumbleweeds, but we can't physically see the, the wind. Same thing with God's spirit. We can't physically see it, but we should see the power of it. So we see, excuse me, the actions, the, the attitude of mankind, when they are influenced by God's spirit. So we, we do the, the good things for people. We do those good works. Now, if we go all the way back to, to Genesis 1 and, and, and on page 1, 
we see a world that was formless, uh, it was empty, it was, it was dark. Uh, and over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the deep. So we see God's spirit, you know, going all the way back to the, the beginning of cre creation. So we can look at Joseph as well. Joseph had God's spirit. So let's go to Genesis 41 and verse 38. So we're going to go to Genesis 41, and we're going to start in verse 38. So in verse 38, in the New King James Version, and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? So then Pharaoh said to Joseph, and as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. And so Joseph had locked up in prison like Akon. He, they got him out of prison. He told Pharaoh that a famine was coming. And the Pharaoh was so, so grateful that he gave Joseph, he was the second in command over all of, all of, all of Egypt. So, he went through these traumatic experiences, trials and tribulations because, you know, he had a bigger purpose. He had a bigger purpose. So he used his brothers to sell him into slavery also. So very, very, you know, heartwarming, touching story. But he was a wise man. And even the Pharaoh that was, you know, worshiping false gods even recognized the wisdom in Joseph. So let's go to Exodus 31. And I definitely need a reader. Exodus 31. If anyone online is willing to read, I would greatly appreciate it. 31. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1 through 5. Hmm? We can hear you, Eric. I'll read it if you want. Okay, thank you, kind sir. All right. 31, 1 through 5? Yes. All right, starting with verse 1, this is King James. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Thank you, Jamal. So we see with Bezalel that that God put his spirit in him. He put his spirit in, in this man to do the things. When we think about all the talents that we have, like God puts this in us to do it. Like Miss Barbara is a wonderful cook. God put this in Miss Barbara to know how to cook. He definitely didn't put it in me to, to know how to cook, you know. So we all have many talents. And uh, Bezalel, he got spirit of God and wisdom, understanding and knowledge and all men of workmanship. So he was an artistic uh, guy also in gold, silver, and bronze, or brass. So now let's go to Judges 3. So we're going to go to Judges 3. And in Judges 3, we're going to start in verse 9 through 10. Thank you, Mr. Sunday. I want the children of Israel to cry out to the Lord. And the Lord raised up the deliverer, children of Israel, who delivered them. For Timon, the son of Timus, Timus, the younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and joined Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered. 
Yeah, that's a hard one right there. But we see even with uh, Othniel that God's spirit came upon him also and it helped him in a minor way. He was able to judge Israel, uh, you know, fairly, righteously, and he was able to go out uh, to war and conquer. So God's spirit works in us and it, it, it shows us what to do. It teaches us. So God's spirit has been here and dwelling in and among his people since before creation. So when a believer has God's spirit living in them, it is made possible for them to live a godly life. So that person no longer lives to fulfill the desires of the, the old nature, but he seeks, he pants to please God. So they show a, a pattern of good works and in doctrine and in integrity and in purity and wholesome speech. And they can't be swayed. They can't be swayed, not even by their opponents. People can't even rile you up to get you mad. Well, I'm going to speak for myself. So the emphasis is shifted from our outward appearance. We may put off the vanity. And we, we, we focus more on outward appearance, our internal beauty, our internal beauty of the spiritual life. So the believer now operates in love, he operates in faith and in good conduct that attracts others to Christ. Now, Paul, in his epistles, he emphasized the need for believers to live in the spirit in order to not fulfill those desires of the old man. He made Christ his example. and He demonstrated it throughout his life as a believer. So this encouraged him to encourage other believers to imitate him. And he said for us to imitate him as he imitated Christ. Now, Timothy is, is, is being an example in spirit by following the lead and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So Yeshua told us before he ascended into heaven that he would send us a helper and that it would guide us in all truth. Now, let's go to John 14. John 14. Yes, we're going to go to John 14. <clears throat> so we're going to go to John 14 and we're going to start in verse 25. So in verse 25, it says, John 14, verse 25, it says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. So peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. So let your heart let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he let them know that the helper was coming, that the comforter was coming, and that that was God's power. So in Acts 2, 1 through 4, it shows at Pentecost the, the mighty Russian wind and the, the spirit that came upon them. So, and they were filled with God's spirit. So let's Go to 1 John 4, and we're going to start in verse 1. 1 right, John 4, we're going to read 1 through 6. Okay, 1 John 4, 1 through 6. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Yeshua has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Yeshua has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them 
because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and they, the world hears them. But we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That was bars right there. <laughs> that was bars. So Timothy, again, was also told to be an example in faith. Now, faith in the Greek uh, here in this context is a word called pistis. And that's spelled P-I-S-T-I-S. So it means faithfulness, belief, or trustworthiness. So in the Greek, it is spelled pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, and it means faithfulness, belief, or trustworthiness. So if you will, turn with me to Matthew 11. And we're going to start in verse 20. All right, Matthew 11, we're going to start in verse 20. All right, so we're going to read from verse 20 through verse 24. So in verse 20, it says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sack sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So Yeshua is urging them and us to, 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 to trust and believe and have faith or pissed us in God when we pray. Now, next, I want to go to Romans 3.3. 3. It's a good question, Bob. <laughs> but after the message, we're gonna let Brother Glenn take it away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go to Romans three, chapter three, and in verse three. So Romans 3 and verse 3, it says, for what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man, I'm going to say that again, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So we have, we, us in this flesh, we have the tendency to tell a lie. So people say, oh, it's just a white lie. It's not a big deal. And God cannot lie. So we want to listen to what God says, you know, before we listen to what man says. So we have a Hebrew word as well for faith or belief, and it is called emunah. It is called emunah. And it comes from the root word, amen. So when we say amen, it means it is so, or firm, or we believe. So, and I, I really like this picture, how it shows the 
person that could be God holding us up as we're walking um, up the stairs. Now, some of y'all may remember uh, Vanessa did a, a, a discipleship training and we did, we drew pictures of what we thought faith was. And I always looked at faith like, like stairs, like taking the first step where we don't even see the bottom of the staircase. I always envision like, I see the first step and it's a whole bunch of clouds around it and I don't see the rest of the stairs, but I just take up walking through the clouds, uh, going down the stairs because I have faith that that is this, the rest of the stairs are down there, right? So, but it can also be translated as faithfulness. So it describes much more than just believing a statement about God for me or anybody else. It reveals a life of full reliance on God. So emuna is belief that results in faithfully implying action. So faith is action as well, like love, like we talked about. So emuna is belief that results in faithfully implying action. So belief that results in faithfully implying action. And can I get someone to read James 2.17? Very, very popular scripture. James 2.17. James 2.17, even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Right. So faith by works is dead. So they go together. Right. So uh, we have to have faith, faith um, by works. So immuna is faith completed by works. So what you do is more important than just what you know. So we have to apply the action. So we're going to look at some ways we can know more about faith. So let's define faith. So we're going to go to Hebrews 11. That is the faith chapter. So we're going to Hebrews chapter 11. So in the scriptures, Faith is defined in Hebrews 11, and we start in verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So for by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. So by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So again, faith, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Going down those stairs and you don't see the rest of the staircase. Can't visibly see the rest of the staircase. So faith is powerful because it reflects the most high. So we're not scared to take those steps uh, into the unknown because we're relying on and putting our absolute trust in God and his word. So we have to also keep in mind that our spiritual heroes that are mentioned in the rest of of Hebrews 11, that they were not without flaws, but they they exuded great, great faith. So thankfully, God doesn't ex expect, you know, total perfection in us from for, for us to recognize, you know, within the, the, these people that are mentioned in uh, chapter 11, that we accept the steps uh, we take in their, in their faith. So I want to read a quote by a theologian. His name is Edmund Perry. So he says, steadiness, however, is not the result of stabilizing oneself with one's own resources. One steadies himself by taking hold of or supporting himself on something or someone regarded to be stable and reliable. So we, we rely, we rely on the most high. We rely on the most high because he can he can stabilize us. He will keep us up. So faith is evident. So next, we'll look at faith in the storm. 
faith in the storm. Sometimes when those storms come, people lose all faith and they think, you know, the, the most high, you know, doesn't love me. You know, oh, God isn't real because I'm going through these things. So we want to keep the faith in the storm. So sometimes God allows us to face a challenge just to test our faith. So if you turn with me to Matthew 14. Let's go to Matthew 14. So Matthew 14, and we're going to start in verse 22. So we're going to read verse 22 through 31. 22. You say you want to read, Ms. Barbara? Okay. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude, sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when the evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves for the wind and for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, mm -hmm. and they cried out for fear. But immediately, Yahweh spoke to them, saying, Be of the cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, is it you? Command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Yahweh. But when the but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, and he cried out, saying, "Lord, save me!" And immediately he stretched out his hand. And caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. Thank you, Miss Barbara. O oh, you of little faith. So in, in the beginning, it says that Yeshua made them get into the boat. Some translations say he constrained them or he insisted that they get on the boat. So so it seems that he intentionally made them get on the boat and he knew the storm was coming. So he knew that they would be scared. He knew that they would cry out to him. So he sent them, he sent them, you know, throughout the storm anyway. So he knew in the middle of the storm, he would reveal his love, his mercy, his trustworthiness. He knew he would calm the storm. So when we're going through a storm, we have to pray harder. We have to show our faith. We have to shop out. We don't shun God away because we're going through something. We we show him that we're still faithful. So we pray harder. We pray more fervently for God's intervention in, in this storm, for him to, to calm it. So in his sovereign wisdom, God gives us these storms for our advantage so that our faith might be perfected. So next, I want to go to Habakkuk chapter 2. And this is a, a, a book that's, I don't hear read that often. So we're going to go to Habakkuk chapter two. In 
And can I get a reader, please? Read. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a um, herald may run with it. For the revelations await an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Definitely. So proud people are puffed up. Um, and I, I was reading from the New Living Translation and it says that, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. So faith is, is backed up with action as we've talked about. Faith placed in God and all that he promised us uh, is Yeshua's, in Yeshua's name is the reason why we are going to be future citizens in God's kingdom. So let's be an example in faith so the people around us can see our faith in action, not just through our words, but how we serve them. So faith pleases God. So one last scripture. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. So Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to read verse 6. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Can I get one last reader? Ms. Charlene, thank you. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So it's, it's, it's impossible to please God without us having faith. So he, he, he put his followers into a storm to see what they would do. You're going to shun me away or you're going to show faith. So, so it's impossible to please God, but he is a reward of those who are going to diligently seek him. So we should be seeking God every day. So family, thank you so much.